My name is Xiang Rui, and I'm a software engineer at Databricks. I'm primarily working on uh, the open source project called MLlib, the one I'm going to talk about it today. And, but it was uh, kind of like a one-hour talk, but I need to ask a few questions to decide which part I should skip. It's uh, how many Spark users? And how many of you have used MLlib? OK. so. How many people went to yesterday's meetup? Uh, it's another Spark meetup. It's talking about pipelines. It's, uh, I think, uh, yesterday down upstairs. And how many of you know uh, alternating list of squares? <laughs> OK, good. <laughs> yeah, let's start with uh, MLlib. Uh, MLlib is a component of Spark, but we should say a little, bit, a few sentences about Spark. Spark is a, a, a fast and general engine for uh, big data processing. It's, uh, think about MapReduce, but faster. And it's kind of like the most active open source project in the big data world. We have more than 500 contributors contributing to the project, and now we have more than 10,000 commits committed. We just have a 1.3 release last week. So definitely just go to Spark website, download it, and try it out. And Spark is uh, the most uh, interesting feature for Spark is uh, it's actually very simple to use. And it scales up to terabytes of data. And you can choose your own language. We provide Python, Java, Scala, and SQL interface. Also, there is a plan to include a Spark R that provides you R interface to Spark. You can just write word count, maybe just in less than 100 words. And uh, but it scales up to terabytes of data. We just won the SALT benchmark last year. And to SALT 100 terabytes in, I think it's in 20 minutes. And for Spark, if you are not that familiar with Spark, there are two most important concept of Spark. The first one is called RDD, Resilient Distributed Data Set. It's uh, how you uh, distribute your data to a cluster and how you describe the mappings between those data sets. It doesn't do the computation where you define a data set. And then as, uh, it only uh, computes the, those data sets in pipelines when you, when you ask for some results. And Spark also support caching. And you can cache your data in memory or on disk to enhance data locality. So it's very useful for machine learning applications because most of the machine learning problems, you need, to, you need some iterative algorithm to solve it. And with traditional MapReduce, and for each iteration, you have to let, load the data from HDFS. That's extremely slow. And Spark, with Spark, it's very easy to get 100x speed up. Uh, compared to uh, MapReduce. And Spark is also a unified framework. And it provides a couple of standard components, like Spark SQL, streaming. And of course, it's SQL is for structured queries. And streaming is for streaming data processing. And today, I'm going to talk about MLlib for machine learning. And we also have a component called GraphX for graph processing. And it works really friendly with uh, the Hadoop world. So it, uh, for example, Spark doesn't have a storage layer. We can talk to directly talk to HDFS uh, through Hadoop input formats, and we can talk to uh, Amazon S3 as a storage layer. And we integrate well with, for example, Cassandra, Mesos, HBase. So it's a it's a good player in the Hadoop ecosystem. And so I'm from Databricks. Databricks is a small company funded by the creators of Spark. So we are the main driven force behind Spark. And uh, we're building our product on top of open source Spark. The product is called uh, Databricks Cloud. Uh, we provide hosted solutions for uh, managing Spark clusters. And also, on top of it, we provide interactive workspace. And you can also just uh, schedule production jobs. And we also have partners who build third-party applications on top of it. We will have a small demo today. So, uh, for, of course, for machine learning. And oh, we are also hiring. So if you want to move to San Francisco, and uh, just uh, let us know. Uh, so then uh, let's talk about MLlib. So MLlib is, uh, 
but initially from Berkeley AmpLab, the same place uh, uh, Spark was born. So it shipped with Spark as a standard component it's in 0 0.8. And now we are at 1.3. It's about one year and a half old. So it's a very young project. But it's very active. We have contributions from more than 50 organizations, and we have more than 100 contributors. So for each uh, talk I give, I just uh, have a script to count the number of contributors. It's, I know it's increasing really fast. And we have a good coverage of algorithms, classification, regression, clustering, recommendation, usually, well, kind of like the table content you see when you open a machine learning textbook. We also have some infrastructure or utilities for machine learning jobs, like uh, uh, how to do this feature transformation, uh, feature extraction, statistics, some linear algebra, and also some data mining tools. And I want to give a brief history, just tell a little bit about the history of MLlib. Um, initially, it starts at 0 0.8, a year and a half ago. And just similar to every machine learning library, we start with some algorithms. And initially, we have linear, linear algorithms and k-means and alternating list of squares. Uh, we support Scala and we support Java. And for the optimization part, we implement gradient descent. And then after three months, we have a three months development cycle for Spark. And in 0 0.9, we added naive Bayes. And for the APIs, we also add a Python API. So there are a lot of Python users, definitely much more than Scala users. And so we su also support Python for in MLlib. Then uh, another three months in 1.0, and we just uh, try to boost the, the performance by just uh, supporting sparse data. We can explore, exploit sparsity uh, for both storage and the computation. We also added a limited memory BF, uh, BFGS. And for algorithms, we added decision tree, uh, PCA, and SVD. So at this time, we have seen, start to see users uh, start using it in their production jobs. And because this is an open source project, it's hard to know who is using it, who download it. So we, we have a good community, and people will ask questions on the user mailing list. And just by monitoring that list, I kind of have a feel about how many users are using it. So then in 1.1, we added st some statistics toolbox and non-active matrix factorization, some streaming linear regression integration with, integrated with Spark Streaming, and Virtuvac, that's a feature extractor. And on the optimization side, we introduced some tree reduce and torrent broadcast to just, uh, imp just to boost the performance to, I think it's uh, about 5x. But there are more users, uh, there were more users using MLlib at that time. But you see here, and there is a gap between the algorithm part and the application part. So we, we didn't just um, uh, think a lot about the API side. So whether it's, e you, whether it's as easy for users to just uh, build applications based on all the algorithms we provide, and that's a question that's actually the first part of my talk today. And then in 1.2, we introduced this pipeline API. And that just uh, tried to fill in this gap. And now users can easily build machine learning pipelines using this pipeline API. For algorithm side, we added random forest, gradient boosted trees, those tree ensembles, and also streaming k-means. Now with 1.3 released last week, and we added a lot of algorithms. And uh, LDA for topic modeling, multinomial logistic regression, Gaussian mixture model, and also some isotonic regression for score calibration, and FP growth for the, some many frequent item sets, and also power iteration clustering is a special clustering algorithm. And uh, besides those algorithms, we also launched a website called Spark Packages. So basically, there are for uh, many users, they have very specific need for their machine learning applications. We cannot just uh, include everything into MLlib because it just it becomes really hard to maintain. So we have to say for some algorithms, maybe it's good for uh, the developers to maintain outside Spark. And then we launch this third-party package index. And for users, they can to find developers and for developers to get feedback from users. 
And then in this release, we have the pipeline API in Python. Also, we have uh, the model positions uh, for some models. Uh, optimization part, we just uh, re re rewrote the LS algorithm, so you can scale up to billions of ratings. That's the second part of my talk today. And uh, we talk about the history. So, and I have been with uh, ML Live for about one year. So this is my understanding of uh, what the goal of ML Lib. We try to make practical machine learning easy and scalable. So it should be easy to build uh, real-world machine learning applications. And it should be able to scale up to real-world data sets. It's a large-scale data set with a uh, couple uh, terabytes. Or, well, that's the, that's the goal here. It's, uh, definitely, it's not a collection of algorithms. We learned kind of lessons from Mahout. Mahout has been there for a couple of years. And it's uh, tried to do a collection of algorithms, but then it become uh, hard to use and hard to maintain. And recently, they deprecated uh, many algorithms because just because well, no one, uh, little, a few people use it, and a few people, very few people knows how, to, how this algorithm works. We try to include those, those well-studied algorithms. Definitely now some algorithms published this year. And because we don't even know that if users ask questions, we don't know how to support it. And the question is how we can just uh, uh, just go back to the 1.1 place. So we have a list of algorithms. And we, we show users using it for their to develop their applications. And how we can just... Uh, help users to develop their own machine learning applications. Uh, let's first talk about the requirements. And starting from an example, machine learning workflow. So um, for example, this is a tax classification problem. You start with some label documents, and you have the label, and you have the text for it. And then you do some feature transformation. First, you tokenize the text. And then you do a hashing TF is a, a term frequencies. You get feature vectors. Then you can use logistic regression to train a classification model. And after that, you can do some evaluation and see uh, is our model working well. And this is a very simple workflow. But um, I would say it's really hard to do this in practice. And think about, well, you may ask, well, I see for each part, actually, it's not that hard. For each component, I can think about maybe four or five libraries to do it. Like feature extraction, I can use NLTK. And I can use Stanford NLP tools. And for logistic regression, I can use LibLinear. I can use Veka. I can use R. And for evaluation, definitely there are many other uh, libraries I can use. But the problem is, uh, you need to connect them together into a pipeline. And think about if I use uh, NLTK for tokenizer and for hashing TF, then I use LibLinear to solve logistic regression. I need to learn how to use each of them and how to connect them. For LibLinear, it has a very specific format. I need to translate uh, the output from NLTK into LibLinear to, to do that. Another problem is uh, you also need to reapply the entire pipeline when you make predictions. And that's the di well, uh, very similar to the training data, but without labels. But sometimes you need to update your code a lot just to do this prediction. Um, that's, that's the bad thing here. And what makes this even complex, more complex, is uh, we also need to tune parameters. And for each of those components, you have a couple parameters to tune. For example, uh, hashing TF, you need to know, well, what's the feature dimension for the output uh, term, term vectors. And for regre regression, logistic regression, you need to config regularization type, regularization constant, number of iterations. For each of them, you may find maybe three or four uh, parameters, hyperparameters. But you put them together, and that's the product of those, and you, the, the parameter space grows exponentially. And now you want to find the best model. And this is kind of hard. And you really think about if you use one library for tokenization and another library for logistic regression, then while well, you 
running on top of that, you want to tune parameters. This is hard. Also, another part of the problem is data input. So now we have a label document. If this is a machine learning task at school, you get the training data directly, which contains labels and features. But in practice, you need to prepare this training data set. For example, if I, this is a spam detection problem, a user may just mark some document as spam. And if user click that, uh, mark this as spam, you get an event, uh, event record just uh, going through ETL, maybe to some uh, HDFS location. And inside this event, you let's uh, imagine that you may have this document ID, user ID, and the click time, and those are the event logs. And now you want to do some content-based uh, analysis and to identify spam articles. But you need to find the content of this article. And this may live uh, inside a database. right? So it may be a, maybe a MySQL database or some HBase. And now you need to just uh, fetch data from two different sources and uh, join them together and to get your training data set. And this is not that easy. And uh, if you are dealing with well, multiple data, data sources. And let's see uh, in 1.1 what we have in MLLib. The first part, just I mentioned data import and export. You want to load the data in, and you want to save your data out. We support libsvm format. It's a text-based format. You have label, and then you have index and value pairs. And we support save as libsvm, load libsvm file, and we have our own format. We put indexes together and put values together. And you can use, say, load label points to load those label points. And you can also use uh, Java serialization and Python pickling to serialize in uh, human and readable data. So, but the problem is uh, we support those very specific, specific formats. And what if I want to have some additional field to save together with or load together with the training data? For example, I want to have IDs. I, in the prediction, I definitely I don't see well just a zero, a, col a single column with zero or ones. I want to see uh, the prediction along with the document IDs. And for example, uh, this is uh, libsvm format is just for uh, supervised learning. It contains a label. But what if I'm doing some unsupervised learning? So do I, but I have to keep this label field. It's definitely not very flexible. And we also want to say we can load from different data sources. Uh, we can also save to different data sources. For example, save directly to a database and use by your uh, online server to just uh, display to do the predictions. And this is one requirement. The second requirement is uh, we're missing, we were missing high-level APIs. And at that time, it, it's really hard to define a workflow. So you need to just uh, write your own code, like I mentioned, uh, to just uh, chain those components. Even we provide uh, all these, those components, but it's not hard to connect them. And uh, we don't have a built-in support for hyperparameter tuning. This is really essential for uh, practical machine learning pipelines. No one can guess what's the best set of parameters. So you need a machine to just uh, decide for you. And the last part is, uh, so usually in big data, it's a really long pipeline. And if you make any error, mistake, at some stage, all, the, all, all of the rest uh, well, very likely become garbage. And you, we need the tools to, for you, easily inspect every, uh, every step, and we want to check the output. But this is not that easy, because, for example, for tr model training, we, we really care about the features. We don't, we, don't, we don't want to see the extra metadata. So it's uh, expensive if we want to carry them over. But in prediction, and we want to validate, we want to check the result. I want to see, well, this is the ID, and this is the prediction, and this is the original text. Put them together, does it make sense? Right, so we want to provide tools for this model inspection. And our solution is this ML pipelines API. And it's uh, just uh, try to uh, make pipeline creation and pipeline tuning easy for users. And it's built on top of the data frames API. 
and we released data frame in 1.3. And basically, it's uh, how many users have used uh, R data frames or pandas? Oh, a lot. Good. So basically, this is the uh, same set of API we inspired by pandas, and but works for big data sets. And it's backed by the Spark SQL engine, which can do this uh, exact execution plan optimization for you. So basically, uh, if you call some aggregate or filter, it doesn't give you the data set. It just gives you the description of the data set. And when you try to use it, and you try to do this, uh, all the optimizations for you, try to reduce the sample size, and try to reduce the number of stages. And it supports uh, basic SQL types, like double, like string. And it also supports dense vector and sparse vectors, just uh, through the user-defined types. For machine learning, we really won't need sparse vectors, because if we use feature transformation, it's very easy to get a vector of size million, one million, but a lot of them are zeros. And then, well, we can use Spark SQL's external data sources to support uh, multiple data sources, like HDFS, S3, Hive, or any well, database that supports ODBC or JDBC. And it's very easy to load the data in from multiple data sources and join them together to prepare your training data set. So we don't have uh, enough time to just uh, introduce DataFrames API. So do check our website, uh, the Spark website. Also, there are a couple uh, videos online to about DataFrames API. Basically, the first part is the RDD API. If you want to compute the average of uh, edges for each department. And the second is the data frame API. But if you are already familiar with R or pandas, well, this is, sounds like the same for you. And then uh, after we have the uh, uh, abstraction for machine learning data sets, and now we want to define pipeline components. This is inspired by the Scikit-learn project. It's the popular machine learning f library in Python. And we define the following abstractions for pipelines. And the first one is transformer. A transformer is easy. And it just transforms one, oh, sorry. It transforms one data frame into another data frame. And then the concept is estimator. The estimator is giving you the training data set. You give me a model. That's the estimator. The model itself is, an, uh, is a transformer. And it can just uh, transform a data frame to another data frame with predictions. And then the pipeline is a, is a list of transformers and estimators. And when you fit a pipeline, the pipeline itself is an estimator. So when you fit a pipeline, you just uh, go through every stage of this pipeline. If this is a transformer, transform the data set. If this is an estimator, train a model and use the model to transform the data set to the next step. So after you fit a pipeline, it becomes a fitted pipeline, a pipeline model, and that is also a transformer. And for evaluator, is uh, given the uh, predictions and labels, and it try to give you a metric that's a double value. So those are the basic concept of pipeline. And if you are already familiar with scikit-learn, so you should be familiar with those concepts already. But we try to just uh, have our own design and to fit the big data world. The first part is we uh, propose some interface for multimodal training. And it's very important is if you can train a model with multiple data sets. Because you have a, if you have a big data set, usually you don't really care about the computation. It's uh, most of, of the com uh, computation time is caused by communication. It's just how many passes you need to make to your data set. So usually you want to just embed multiple training processes into a single pass. And just to, uh, so here the, the interface is uh, you supply a list of parameter sets and I give you a list of models. In this way you can, for example, compute multiple gradients in a single pass. Or you can, you can broadcast the data set and to different worker nodes and uh, train more separate models uh, in parallel and then collect back all the models. And that's the way you can parallelize single machine solvers. And the other part we 
we change the scikit-learn designs how we specify parameters. And in scikit-learn, you specify parameters by strings. And this is how you specify a param grid in scikit-learn. The hashing underscore tf is the ID for the pipeline component. And then underscore underscore that separates the parameter name from the, from the component ID. And then you set number of features. You choose from 1,000 to 10,000. And this is not that user friendly because it's very easy to make mistakes. Right? So, and sometimes you don't, it's hard to discover those mistakes. And in MLlib, is, uh, we try to say the parameter is a member of the, the component. And you can just uh, tap in the parameters and refer, uh, reference these parameters outside the component scope. And you see, you can say hashing tf dot number of features. Well, this is nice because if you are work under uh, uh, integrated development environment, or you are working under a console with uh, code completion, and it can com auto complete for you. And I can also insert some help messages into this uh, this uh, pr uh, prom instance, so you can get uh, self-contained docs. And the next step is how to tune uh, uh, estimator, how to tune models. And we implemented cross-validation, and which is uh, agnostic to the un underlying estimator and the evaluator. Remember how we define estimator and how we define evaluator. So the cross-validator doesn't need to know about what the estimator is. It could be a logistic regression uh, because it's an estimator. It could be a, a pipeline because the pipeline itself is an estimator. So in this way, we can actually tune the entire pipeline easily. And here we say, let's tune this pipeline using this evaluator and with those, this param grid. And just uh, with number of false three, let's run. So that's easy. And uh, so there are a couple uh, work in progress. It's n definitely not complete. So the first part is uh, attributes. I want to provide uh, feature attributes like names, like uh, if this is a categorical data, what are the categories? I want to add more feature transformers, like uh, how to turn a categorical feature into uh, binary features. And also, we want to just uh, move all more algorithms under this uh, pipeline API. So there are more choices you can use. And then, well, we need to figure out how to persist a pipeline. So after you train a pipeline, definitely you don't want to respend uh, maybe 10 hours to retrain the entire pipeline. Let's sh you should be able to save them to disk. And also, f because in 1.4, we are going to uh, have Spark R in Spark. We also want to provide the same pipeline API in Spark R. That's the work in progress for pipelines. OK, so that now let's go to the second part of my talk. It's, uh, we talked about higher level APIs. Now we really want to go to uh, the lower level part, how we optimize the algorithm such that they are scalable. I want to use this example because I have been spent uh, well, reasonable time on just optimizing uh, authentication list of squares. It is for collaborative filtering. So if you already know collaborative filtering, and it's uh, you have a rating matrix, you have some user item and the ratings. And if you already know it, this is also a Sudoku. <laughs> you can spend some time on it. So basically, you have some observed ratings. And I point out a question mark here in the middle. Uh, what, what should this user uh, read this item. Uh, give me the r predictive rating. Uh, if this is a screw, so <laughs> basically you, you know it's uh, if you spend a couple hours on it, that's a nine. And <laughs> so, but if I say all the ratings are independent, then you don't have a good way to to say about well, what the value should be, right? We need some uh, rules like Sudoku, and we need some assumptions here to how to reconstruct this matrix. And the assumption here is the low rank assumption. And basically, uh, think about if I ask question, what kind of movie do you like? So you don't just uh, return a list of movies and let me figure out, right? So it's uh, just that you tell maybe sci-fi or maybe crime action that I know your taste. And usually this, uh, this preference uh, is taking place in a lower dimensional latent space. And we can just use inner product we can map all the maybe users' movies to this latent space and use inner product there to estimate the ratings. 
And with that model, actually, so we have this low rank assumption, the rating matrix A here is uh, approximately the multiplication between U and the V. And each of them is a rank K, it's a tall and skinny matrix. And so this is uh, how we evaluate the model, how to find the U and the V. Uh, the good, definitely, well, for example, if I say I love uh, colored movies, well, it doesn't tell you much about my taste, right? So we need to find the right descriptor for my preference. And, but uh, the algorithm doesn't know much about it. We need to find uh, some uh, objective for it. The easiest one is the reconstruction error. So we can just do this, uh, the Fabinius norm of A minus U transpose V. But the problem here is uh, there are a lot of unobserved ratings. And we cannot just uh, define this objective. We cannot compute it because there are so many unknowns. And then the solution is simple. is let's just check out what, uh, what we have seen. And let's just do this, uh, estimate the reconstruction error on those ratings. And so this is the objective function, uh, the bottom part. And then, well, this object, for well, it's clear this is the objective, but it's not that clear how to solve it because it's, uh, it's not convex. By convex means uh, your limit is easy to solve and there's a unique optimal solution. This is not convex, but uh, if we fix one side, remember we have the u times v. If we fix u and solve for v, actually this problem becomes really nice. It's a convex problem and it's uh, separable. By separable, if I uh, write, it, write the objective down in this form, you see it actually is a sum of uh, small objects and those, uh, those objectives are independent of each other. So we can solve those sub-problems separate in, in parallel. So this algorithm is really well, good for parallel computation. And for each sub-problem, it's at least a square problem. So that's why this is called alternating least of squares. We take alternating directions, and for each direction, we solve a lot of least of square problems. And the complexity, and to solve a least of square problem of size n by k, usually we need n k square time. And so the total computation cost is the number of ratings times k square. Remember, if we want to scale up to maybe a couple billions and times k square, k is usually 10, 20, 30, but that's a, that's a really large scale here. And for each one, we use this uh, called normal equation approach in LS to solve it. The storage requirement is kind of uh, k square to, to store a transpose a. Then uh, if we are just uh, writing a paper, well, we are done here. So it's a nice algorithm, and we do some experiments, small experiments, and it works well. It beats the baseline, and we can publish a paper. But for, for Spark, well, we can just end here. We need to think about how to implement it, this algorithm on Spark. So also, we need to how to scale up. For example, in 1.1, we have an implementation. It's already a good implementation that can scale up to a couple billions. But now, while well, there are users ask for more, and I spent some time just to think about how to scale up to 100 billion ratings. And then, while well, we can, I think maybe we can just deal with uh, really large data sets. And the first part is always communication. When you just uh, translate or part the algorithm to a parallel system, it's a uh, think about communication. And if we want to say, we want to handle billions of ratings with millions of users and items, we have to distribute the ratings onto different machines. And then the question is how we distribute the data. And I see maybe the first choice is O to O. And for each vector, remember we, in the alternating uh, directions, we fix U and solve for V, we have vectors for uh, factors for all the items and then we use those uh, feature vectors to solve for user vectors. And now, this is a graph to describe the ratings. Basically, if there is a connection, means there is an observed ratings. And suppose we have u, and now let's solve for v. And v1 is connected with u1, u1 and u2. That means we need to send uh, the vector u1 and the vector u2 to v1. 
And for V2, we need to send U1, U2, and U3. And if we do it in this way, we shuffle a lot. It's uh, just basically the number of ratings times k. k is the, the size of the vector. And well, this is maybe still a, a order of magnitude smaller than the computation cost. If you remember, it's the number of ratings times k square. However, so it's, uh, com computation is happening inside CPUs. It's much faster than just uh, transferring data. So even the sample size number of ratings times k, this is a lot. Remember, you may have already have terabytes of ratings. Now it's time you need to time it with k. And that's maybe, well, you cannot even store the sample files. And also, the other part is that it's sending too much. It's, uh, for example, if v1 and v2 are on the same machine, uh, we shouldn't send u1 twice. We should just send u1 once to that machine. So we can do this block-to-block uh, -block, uh, commun communication. For example, let's uh, put U1 and U2 on, on a machine called P1, and U3 on a machine called P2. And now, same, similarly, we group V1 and V2 into Q1, and V3 and V4 into Q2. Now, we know I only need to send U1 to Q1, and U2 to Q1, U3 to Q1, and but we for each target block, that's Q, I only need to send a vector once, uh, not uh, multiple times. And inside the Q1, I know, well, let's extract the subgraph from the previous graph. I know how to compute V1 from U, U1, V1, uh, V1 from U1, U2, and V2 from, from U1, U2, U3. So basically, in this way, we can save a lot of communication by just uh, sending a vector to a block rather than to an individual item. And then we call P1, P2, we call out blocks because those blocks, our information is uh, for this user vector, which target uh, item block I should send to, right? This is called out block. And uh, for Q1, we call it in blocks. Basically for each item and which user factor I should use. And it's the subgraph described in the in the Q block. And this is our data structure used in the MLlibs implementation. And if you check clear, uh, closely, we see we actually we, we can, in this way, we can actually cache P1, P2, those in blocks and the out blocks. Then in each iteration, we only shuffle the, the vectors we really need to shuffle. So we don't shuffle uh, extra data. But if you look at carefully, we actually cache two copies of ratings. It's uh, for user uh, in blocks, and uh, we kind of like a, a copy of the original ratings. And for item in blocks, they are different. Uh, we ca we ca uh, cache another copy. And this is the very uh, common in this uh, distributed implementation of machine learning algorithms. We just uh, try to save communication just by have uh, duplicating the data. And the next part is, uh, since we want to put two copies of the ratings, maybe we should find the efficient storage for it. And we want to save storage. And let's talk about the storage format for in-blocks. And well, remember in-blocks is kind of uh, the subgraph for, for, uh, for items. And we can just uh, store a list of rating tuples and for Q1, this is for Q1, let's go back here. This is a small, a small subgraph on the uh, top right corner. And we have those five ratings. However, if we store it in this way, and also in Java, and there's a huge storage overhead. Remember, it's a, we have, for example, we have a first tuple, it's called V1, U1, A11. And that's an integer, integer, and a float. And, but we use a tuple to store it. The tuple takes an extra pointer that's uh, long. So if you add them up, the overhead is kind of like, a, well, a lot, maybe 50%. And also, it creates a lot of objects inside your virtual machine. And you have uh, billions of tuples. And it gives you a uh, really high pressure to the garbage collection. And usually, you see a GC pulse. It uh, means the GVM is uh, pausing. It doesn't do anything just for GC. And usually this is bad for, well, distributed computation. So we need to 
optimize the storage format. And we switch to primitive arrays. And now let's uh, just store items in an array and uh, users in an array and the, the corresponding ratings. In this way, we only have three objects. That's uh, three primitive, primitive arrays. So it's very low GC pressure. And then we need to, for each, uh, each item, we need to construct, remember, we need to construct this uh, list of square problem to solve it. And, but the items are, uh, are v, v1, v2, v1, v2, v2. So we need to construct uh, all sub-problems together because they are not in a certain order. We need to first, we see v1. We construct the list of square problems for v1. And then we see v2. We start constructing a list of square problem for v2. That means we need to hold, we need to hold all those uh, list of square problems, partial list of square problems in memory that we need n times k square storage on this partition. And usually n is already a couple million, but now you want to time it with a k square. It's very easy to run out of memory. And then, yeah, let's, uh, let's make the, uh, the items ordered. We have v1, v1, v2, v2, v2. And now, well, of course, the users and the ratings are ordered accordingly. And now we can just uh, construct sub-problems and solve those problems one by one. And that means we save the memory requirement from n k square to k square. We only need a single instance. And we just uh, keep constructing it, solve it, clear the content, and construct another sub-problem. And we also need to find a way how to, how to solve a race. And this is a very classical problem, but we need to solve a race for three in parallel. There's a three arrays to be ordered. And we use uh, this team sort. It's the default sort method in Java 7, but not in Java 6. And uh, basically, it creates a less number of objects than quick sort, and it's very useful for sorting really big data. And this is the default sort in Spark, also the sort method we use to, to win the be sort benchmark. And after that, we see, if you go back, you see v1, v1, v2, v2, v2. Well, there are duplicate ad user items. Let's just compress items. We only say v1, v v2, and then keep the, keep the index to track which range is for v1, which range is for v2. And then we don't have duplicate items. But then uh, the problem is uh, you still have to look for vectors, for user vectors. For example, I want to see v1 is with v u1, and I want to construct this uh, list of square problem. I want to get a u1 vector from the out blocks, but I need to construct a map to get a u1 uh, vector. But map lookups is expensive, also it's not uh, memory efficient. Remember, we are at really large scale. And we don't want to construct a hash map of, well, millions of items. That's not that efficient. So we we just uh, end up with only store the block IDs and the local indices instead of the original user IDs. And because I don't really need to know the original user IDs, and I can uh, remember the graph. Uh, for Q1, I get vectors from P1. I get vectors from P2. I only need to remember. Maybe I only use the first vector from P1 and the second vector from P2. And that's all I need to know to construct the, construct the uh, list of square problem. So I only need to store the block IDs and local indices rather than the user IDs. And now we can also just encode those two integers into a single integer uh, using the higher bits to store block IDs and use the lower bits to store local indexes. Because uh, usually the partition is done in a random fashion, uh, such that the number of ratings on each partition is uh, r relatively balanced. So if the total number of users is less than 4 billion, usually that's the case. Uh, <laughs> so we can just uh, split an integer into two parts and uh, store block ID and, uh, in the first part and store local index in the second part. So this is the experiments, experimental result we have. We first uh, test uh, the Amazon Reviews data set. We make copies of it to just uh, to scale it up. And you see the graph here. The blue line is Mahout. And because in each iteration, you need to just uh, reshuffle the data, and it's very slow. It cannot really scale up to uh, 
to, to a reasonable scale. And for MLLib in 1.2, uh, it's much better than Mahout. But you see in 1.3, after we implement all these optimizations, it's kind of like at least 2x faster. And on very large scale, it's kind of like a 4x to 5x faster. And it's very stable. You don't see a lot of a GC happening. And then we uh, went to a really big data set. It's a 15 node, uh, using a 15 node R3 AX large cluster, well, very good cluster. And we run on a 50 billion ratings and about 50 million users and 20 million items. This is a really large data set. We can finish the 10 iterations in just one hour and with rank 10. And actually, this is a very good result. We also tested even scale to even larger than 100 billion ratings, but I forgot the, the timing here. Uh, so uh, let's recap here how we optimize, how we scale uh, in, uh, algorithm. First, we save communication by just uh, duplicating data. And this is have seen in many distributed algorithms. We try to use efficient storage to reduce the GC overhead and uh, to save uh, memory requirement. And we also use some native, I didn't mention here, use native uh, BLAST and LAPAC uh, routines to accelerate the linear algebra operations. And that's the way we scale LS to billions of ratings. So yeah, that's my talk. And we really want to make MLLib uh, an easy and a scalable machine learning library and for users in the industry. So. Uh, for the pipeline API, and it's still experimental, and I want to see whether we can stabilize it in the next release. So please do check it out and check Spark uh, MLlib document and try some pipeline example and try to map your existing pipelines into this pipeline API and see how it fits. And just let me know if it doesn't work well for your application and we can still have time to change. And the second part is, uh, well, we try very hard to just uh, to have a good scalability. And we try to design the algorithm correctly. And we try to use all the acceleration method. We are also testing some GPU uh, libraries to accelerate linear algebra libraries, linear algebra operations. And those are a few links here. And Spark, our website, remember we are hacking. And also, we had Spark Summit yesterday, Spark Summit East. Uh, if you missed it, there will be videos online. Watch the YouTube Spark channel. And we also have a Spark Summit West in San Francisco this June. Yeah. OK, thank you. Questions? Right. So the question is uh, how to uh, trans transport data, transfer data through different language APIs. Spark is implemented in Scala. And for, for the data frames API, it's actually all the data stays in the, in the, on the Scala side. And the Java, the Python side, we only host a, a pointer to the Scala side. And when you really need the data uh, on the Python side, we use a Python for Z. And that's a library connect Python with a JVM machine and through sockets. And we try to serialize the data from the SVM uh, on the JVM side to the Java side to the Python side, and, but if you do this uh, data frames operations, actually nothing happens is happening on the Python side. So you get native performance. As long as the only part is uh, has a overhead is you want the data out, you want to see the data in Python. Yeah, it's through sockets. Right. Uh -huh. So if you have UDFs defined in Python and you want to use it in the in your pipeline, and definitely we need to go through this uh, data serialization part. Otherwise, we cannot understand your UDF in Python or inside the Scala code. We have to talk to the Python side. There will be there is an overhead, but we try to provide uh, common UDFs so you don't have to define your own in Python in most cases.
Mm, no. So the question is, uh, uh, when we uh, just uh, translate uh, data from P to Q, and those are from user uh, out blocks to item in blocks, we want to have a lot of partitions. And um, we, we have fixed number of partitions. But during the shuffle, and for example, for P1, and you need to store, it has a shuffle file indicates with pointers indicate this part is going to Q1, and this part is going to Q2. That's the, well, that's uh, common for shuffles. Uh, but the number of partitions stays the same. Yeah. Uh, Nonlinear SVM. Uh, we don't have, uh, right now for SVM, we only have an implementation for linear SVM and with uh, L2 and L1 regularization. Uh, TCP, uh, uh, it's the overall communication. You sum up all the communication cost. Well, I think it's through TCP. That's true. Yeah. Uh, we you actually we use. Uh, I'm not sure. I think we use ACA for uh, for this uh, message. Uh, Broadcasting or message sending messages, and the underlying it, I actually I'm not sure. So which protocol it uses? There's not much overhead, but you definitely you don't want to do level one or level two uh, blast operations uh, in native code because there will be some overhead. But for level three, because the computation cost is kind of like an N cube, so even you just uh, eat that overhead, it's still faster than your Java implementation. And we call native blast and LPI code through a library called Netlib Java. And it provides a Java interface for it's some blast like interface. And underlying it, it has a JNI a layer and then talk to the native code. Oh, sorry? Oh, so, uh, the question is adoption of Spark. So uh, Matei, this creator of Spark, uh, gave a talk yesterday at Spark Summit. And right now we have, uh, I think, more than 500 companies are using Spark in production. And there is also a wiki page called uh, Powered by Spark. And there is a list of companies and uh, one sentence describing their use cases. And you can check it out. Uh, so uh, the Spark is an open source project. Uh, it's an Apache project. H2O is a is a machine learning project from Hex Data, and I think uh, we H2O provides uh, some integration with Spark through this uh, uh, serialize through RDD to their data frames, and uh, you can you can run machine learning algorithms on top of it, but uh, that's just two different libraries. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, here is uh, for save and load in 1.3 we added the save and load function to uh, general linear models and uh, naive bayes uh, alternating list of squares and all the tree ensembles, decision tree and random forest. And you can say, after you train a model, you can just call save, and we use Parquet to save the model. But it's not available in the pipeline API. So the next step will be, well, let's do that in the pipeline API. You can save the entire pipeline, and that will be really good. 
And after you can possess your model, and you can always load it back and run predictions with Spark Streaming. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh.